we're going to continue in the application guide and get right into the criteria, number one and two. So those are found on pages 15 through 17. And they discuss critical lack of park space and significant poverty. So the intent of this program is to have projects in areas with critical lack of park space and significant poverty. So criteria one and two is going to provide this data for us and help describe your disadvantaged community. So applicants are going to identify their project site and provide a community fact finder report based on each project location that you're going to be submitting. So I'll show you a tutorial of the fact finder tool in just a minute. But first, I want to draw your attention down to the bottom of page 15 and just take a moment to read what kind of project is ineligible. So the box down at the bottom, just take a moment and read that. Okay, so ineligible, just going to um, point out that if your community fact finder report shows that your half mile radius has more than three acres of park space per 1000 residents and the community has a median household income above 56,982, both of them, then the project site is ineligible. But let's talk about how to look for a site that is eligible. So all you need to do is make sure that the half mile radius reflects either less than three acres of parkland per 1000 residents or a median household income under $56,982 to be eligible. So again, in order to be eligible, you only have to be under one of those thresholds. Okay, so I'm going to do a quick tutorial on the Community Fact Finder tool. Sam's gonna take us back to our website right now. And there's actually three documents that we have on our website that are related to the Fact Finder. So the first one is the Community Fact Finder website that we'll take you to in just a minute. The second one is the Community Fact Finder Handbook, and I'll briefly talk about that as well. And then the third thing on our website is a video. It's actually a YouTube tutorial video of the Community Fact Finder. So that's a really great new, uh, you know, new thing to check out. All right, so for right now, we're gonna go to the Community Fact Finder website. And for the purposes of today, we're just going to put in Sacramento, California. But if you have already selected a site, then go ahead and put in the address of that park site. All right, so Sacramento, it brings us to the heart of Sacramento right here at Capitol Park. And you'll notice that the blue pin is located on the edge of Capitol Park and then the reddish orangish circle represents the half mile radius around that blue pin. So the data on the left hand side is what we're going to be looking at to make sure that this site is eligible. What we're going to be looking at is the median household income and the parks per 1000 people. So as you can see, if this were to be your project site, even though the parks per 1000 people shows 7.51 acres, so that's over three acres, this site is still eligible to be submitted for your application because the median household income is under that threshold of 56,982. So as you can see, the median household income here is 36,344. So this is an eligible site if this happened to be your proposal. And then we're also, for criteria one and two, also we look at the people in poverty. And so uh, points are awarded for criteria one and two. They're determined when we take the park acres per 1,000 residents, the median household income, and the number of residents below poverty. And we place them on statewide scales as shown in the scoring rubrics on pages 15 through 17 in the application guide. 
So these uh, scoring boxes right here um, is how all statewide applications are ranked. All right, so now we are going to go to the Community Fact Finder Handbook. All right, so this is what the Community Fact Finder Handbook looks like. And just want to point out, it's very, very important that you follow the rules and guidance laid out in this handbook before you start planning your project. And in fact, it's probably the most important thing that you can do at the beginning of your planning process is to follow this handbook. Make sure that you find a project site that you believe meets all of the rules in this handbook, because we want you to be able to submit a final fact finder report that is not only eligible, but also competitive. So the fact finder handbook is going to give you some visual tips of how it all works. Basically, in a nutshell, what I want to stress is that this handbook is going to help you understand the rules. So one of the rules is basically making sure that your pin is located on or within the project site boundary and also identify what type of land should or should not be counted as park acreage by the community fact finder. So in summary, you'll wanna review the half mile radius of the project site using the fact finder. Make sure that once you generate your fact finder report that the pin is on or in the boundary of the project site. So what I mean by this is that it's not across the street. It's not one, two or three blocks outside of the project site. Also, you're going to make sure that you report all park acreage additions and or removals to our office as soon as possible. I suggest you start on this today if you already have a project in mind or a site in mind. Start using this tool. Make sure that, that you're going to report again all acreage additions and or removals to our office and you again can start that right now. Our office actually goes through the same steps in this handbook as applicants do to verify that the submitted report is accurate and that it meets all of the rules in the handbook. So what we do when we get your fact finder report is we actually take the project ID number from your fact finder and take that number and put it into a satellite interface, which takes our staff to the exact precise point where your fact finder report was created. So this ensures that all statewide applicants are some more submitting uh, your, you know, your report with the pin tip inserted at the project site. So to make sure it's a fair process. If a rule is not followed, such as the applicant does not report acreage that should have been added to the fact finder database, we have the right to generate a new report with the pin located in the middle of the project site, which can potentially make your project site ineligible or less competitive. So the applicant loses the ability to place the pin anywhere within the boundary. So for these reasons, it's very, very much to your advantage to please use this handbook and especially follow the rules in the blue boxes and Sam showing you right now what the blue boxes are. So it's very important to make sure not only read this whole guide, but the rules are highlighted for you in the blue boxes. OK, so with that, um, after the webinar, please make sure that you read the criteria on pages 15 through 17 and also refer to the technical assistance on page 57 in the back of your application guide. Make sure that you read the Community Fact Finder Handbook in detail and also check out our Fact Finder YouTube tutorial video, especially for those of you who have never worked with the Community Fact Finder report before. So with that, Victor, is there anything in the chat that you want to bring up at this time? Yes, um, thank you, Natalie. So we did receive a few questions earlier um, and as well as recently on the Fact Finder which I'll cover right now. Um, 
the uh, first question is, um, what if my existing park has undeveloped um, areas? And that's a great question. Um, if the undeveloped areas are part of the official park uh, acreage, the official park boundary, that uh, property, um, that acreage cannot be removed. So um, what what will not happen is carving out certain elements of the park. Now, on the other hand, if that acreage is not part of the official park boundary and you are proposing to expand the park by adding adjacent acreage to become part of the official park boundary, and for some reason that land is being counted as park acreage, um, this could happen sometimes when the city has acquired adjacent property um, but has not yet made it part of the park. So if you have that unique situation, uh, you can report it by, as Natalie said, by sending an email to the SCORP email address following the Fact Finder Handbook uh, reporting steps. OK, so we could take a look at that. Um, the other question is, if I have a uh, 14 acre park, do I have to place the pin in the middle of the park or on the boundary? And so as Natalie mentioned, and this is also provided in visual examples on both the Fact Finder Handbook as well as the Fact Finder video on our website, you have the flexibility of placing the starting point, which is the pin, anywhere within the boundary of your 14 acre park, for example. So your, your project site is considered the entire park. Okay, so in a large, an example of a large regional park, for example, let's say it's a, a 200 acre large park, you can also place your uh, starting point of the half mile radius anywhere within those 200 acres. As long as it's on the boundary of the 200 acre park or anywhere within the 200, 200 acre park, you're fine. What's not allowed, and this is a key point Natalie made, oh, I just want to reemphasize, what is not allowed is placing the pin outside of your park. So outside of the proposed park, outside of the proposed expansion, um, you have you cannot place it one or two or three blocks outside of the, of the proposed park. It has to be within the boundary or on the boundary of the um, of the park. So that's a really a key point. Um, you will actually certify this and we will check for it um, during during the application review process. It's to your advantage to follow the rules in the Fact Finder Handbook. So as you go through the handbook, make sure you pay close attention to the blue boxes. If Sam show the blue box one more time on, on one of the pages, uh, the blue boxes are there to to really bring close attention to uh, the rules that have to be followed. So play th th there. There you see an example. Um, the final question we had on the fact finder is can you please explain the ranking a little bit more and um, on page 15 through 17 of the application guide uh, it shows you three different scales uh, those scales are going to be statewide so for example under criteria number one the uh, ratio of park acreage per 1000 residents um, let's say uh, your your uh, fact finder report for your project area has a ratio of one acre of park space per 1000 residents that will that number will be placed on a statewide scale of all applications so it is to your advantage to try to find an area that has as um, few park acres per 1000 residents as possible um, or uh, a low median household income or a, a high number of people below poverty. So uh, one of the common questions is, do you have to be under both the three acres per spark, per uh, three acres of parkland per 1000 residents and be below the 56,000 median household income threshold? And the answer is no, you don't have to be below both. And the second question is, uh, do, you, do you get more points if you're below both? And the answer is it depends. It really depends, obviously, on the applications that come forward. And we don't know 
um, what applications will come forward in this round. Um, but let's use the, an example where it could be uh, 2.9 acres per 1,000 resi residents, which is just below the threshold, and the median household income could be 55,000, which is just below the threshold, right? So that's an example where the project site would be just barely below both thresholds, okay? And you can have another example where it could be, a, let's say, a new park with zero acres uh, within the half mile radius, okay? So there's no existing parks and the median household income is $80,000. Um, so that's an example where it's eligible and that could be more competitive or on the reverse, it could be a very low income um, and a high park acreage. Uh, so, it, so it really is going to depend how the numbers play, numbers play out based on what applications come forward. Uh, there's no bonus points for being below both thresholds. All right, so thanks for that question. Um, also, I just want to um, also want to. Um, so yeah, Amanda just asked the same question. Uh, if we have zero parks, but we have a median income of 76,000, um, how does that work? And so the good news in that example is you are definitely eligible. Um, you're you're below the even though the income is ab above the fifty six thousand dollar threshold the project would definitely be eligible because the park acres is below the three acres per 1,000 residents threshold. So that would make the site eligible. Um, another good question we just got from Tanya is, uh, do golf courses qualify as parks under this program? And uh, the answer is it depends on whether it is a public golf course that is owned by a public agency um, for the purpose of, of course, public recreation. Golf is definitely considered out, uh, public recreation. So yes, if it is a city, county, uh, uh, park district, public agency owned golf course, that is definitely considered uh, a public, a form of public recreation, and it will remain in the foul finder. If there's a golf course that's publicly owned within your project areas, half mile radius, that's not being counted by the fact finder, that would be something you would have to report because one of the key um, comments Natalie made is before you finalize the selection of your project site, you want to thoroughly review the half mile radius of the project site you are considering to make sure that there are no existing parks that may not be counted by the fact finder because if you do find them, you have to report them. And because we will thoroughly review every half mile radius. And if we catch it, we will add it to the fact finder and then move your pin to the middle of your project site. So it is to your advantage to thoroughly review the half mile radius now and then send any updates to the SCORP address following the fact finder handbook as soon as possible. So we can go ahead and add that acreage or remove acreage. Uh, as soon as possible so you can have a good idea of what, how the numbers will look once the updates are made. So I, I do encourage you to do that this month or September. Uh, that would be very helpful. And it takes usually about two weeks for us to make the updates live on the fact finder. So keep that in mind. Uh, definitely don't wait till uh, December for this if, if possible. Um, another question is, uh, do you calculate income poverty by region? Emily, great question, great question. Um, so it, it is statewide. Uh, however, we do understand, um, I'll just use an example that most people are aware of. Um, in rural, in many rural areas, uh, the incomes tend to be lower. Uh, so that's an advantage to rural areas. Um, and But then in the Bay Area, where, for example, where the incomes, t median household income tends to be higher, um, the number of people below poverty, which is a five point uh, criterion number 2B on page 17, is designed to help balance uh, balance the difference between median household income, um, where rural areas tend to have a really strong advantage uh, with uh, sometimes higher incomes in um, in more populated areas. Also, uh, and, and thank you so much for your question, criteria number nine a 
which Richard will cover in about 20 minutes, um, is designed for the applicant to tell the story of the need for the project. That's not covered by the fact finder. So other data you want to provide or just the human story about why is this project needed for this community is 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 your place to um, um, make that case and tell that story so that uh, the department can consider other uh, factors not covered by by the fact finder. Um, let's see here, looking at the questions. OK, so I'll, I'll respond to the rest of the questions uh, through chat. I just want to say thank you for your questions. Um, it's good to see more activity now because sometimes your questions really help us uh, bring other issues and provide clarification that we otherwise are not planning to provide in this presentation. So we definitely welcome you to uh, challenge us with your questions. It, it helps make our presentation more helpful. So thank you very much.